Our quality of life is closely tied to how well our bodies work. When it's working great, life is good. We feel like we can do anything. When it isn't working so well, though, life's not as good as it could be. Maybe you woke up this morning with a, with a sore back. Maybe that knee is uh, hurting you some. You kind of wish you were back in the good old days when things worked really well. But sometimes things don't work well at all. And when they do, life, life's not good. And maybe you go to the doctor, and if it's particularly bad, uh, you're looking for some way to treat uh, this uh, broken organ or tissue. And the way that doctors have treated it for thousands of years, when it's really severe, is they simply cut it out. They cut it out and send you on your way and tell you you're a survivor. Be happy in that, even though you may have lost some function. So you have cancer, we'll cut it out. You have a car crash, you injure a limb, we can amputate, we can cut it out. So that's the way that medicine has dealt with very severe problems for thousands of years. That was until this happened. This is a painting that hangs up in Boston of the very first organ transplant. Now in it, the kidney of one person was placed into another. And by doing so, uh, the recipient was able to live on a much better quality of life for a number of years. This is really significant because it changed the way that we treated disease. Instead of cutting it out and sending the patient on the way and say, you're a survivor, we could actually cut out the disease tissue and give them something equivalent to or better than what they had before. And so it kicked off the whole field of organ transplantation. And it has really affected the lives in a good way for millions of people. But we've run into a problem. Uh, this graph here shows the uh, number of organ transplants that have happened in the United States over the last decade, as shown by that bottom green line. The line above it represents the number of organs that people are wanting, wanting to get, that they're waiting for. Now, simple economics here. The demand for organs far exceeds the supply. So if you need it, you're probably not going to get it right away. You've got to wait for it. Now, you'll also notice that the supply of organs, the bottom line is virtually flat. It hasn't grown, despite all the efforts to increase the number of organ donors. But the demand is going up each year. So this problem is getting worse and worse. It is a critical problem. We have to do something about it. But it's even worse than that. There's actually another line on this graph, one that I couldn't fit on the screen. That line goes above the lights here. It actually goes probably even above this building. That line represents the number of people that could benefit from a tissue replacement. Let me put it another way. Every 30 seconds, a patient dies from diseases that could be treated with a tissue replacement. Every 30 seconds. So that means by the end of my talk, over 20 people will have died because they couldn't get the tissue that they needed. This is a huge problem. Now, as a scientist, I can stand up here and quote all about facts and figures, very comfortable doing that. But it really struck me the day that uh, I got some news from, from one of my family members. I had gone to the doctor, and the doctor was looking over uh, her blood work. And he looked up and basically said, I know when your 30 seconds is going to be up. And after that, you're gone. And because of one thing, she had absolutely no chance to be on that waiting list. She had to be on the other line, the line that we don't see. And unfortunately for us, we will probably be on that line that we don't see if we don't do something about it. But why is this even a problem? If you think about our bodies, we have an amazing ability to regenerate. Just for a second, look at, look at your fingertips. Uh, you have probably have all had a paper cut at some point in your life. It hurts and it bleeds, but eventually it, it stops bleeding, the pain goes away, it heals up, you have no lasting reminder of that paper cut. So our bodies have an amazing ability to regenerate. But when the damage gets too large, the body panics. 
And instead of just regenerating, it goes into survival mode. It does anything and everything it can to make sure you survive, even at the loss of function. Now, we have developed life-saving technologies over the last few decades where we don't need the body to go into panic mode. We just need it to go into regenerate mode. And so what we try to do is we're trying to shift the equilibrium more to regeneration instead of simple making you a survivor with the loss of function. Now, if we could reduce that injury down to nothing more than the size of a paper cut, or at least trick the body into thinking it's no more than a paper cut, we should be able, the body should be able to regenerate the, the damage. And in fact, uh, Dr. Anthony Atala showed that you could paint cells onto a three-dimensional canvas, implant that in the body, and the body thinks, wow, this is nothing more than a paper cut. I'm going to regenerate. So he was able to show that with, uh, with bladders. Uh, just a couple days ago, there was a report about taking stem cells, putting them onto a tube, and you could actually build a windpipe so that a child could breathe once again. So the body has the amazing ability to regenerate. We just have to give it some help. But if we start thinking about more complex organs, uh, for example, if we're thinking about uh, trying to build kidneys, this is uh, looking at the vascular system or the blood vessels inside a kidney. It's extremely complex. I certainly want to, don't want to be the one having to paint cells onto all those little, little parts. So we have to come up with other ways to be able to deliver cells and deliver the materials to be able to make an organ so the body thinks it's nothing more than a paper cut. And that is where 3D printing comes into play. So uh, probably sitting at your home is an inkjet printer and it can print all kinds of amazing things. So why can't it print organs? And where can we, and so if we look at three-dimensional printing, which has become the rage today, we should actually be able to print organs. 3D printing is really amazing because it can take these wonderful ideas in our head and actually put them down on paper or, or create a, a three-dimensional representation of what we want. Uh, for example, uh, someone actually was able to print clothing to make a perfectly formed dress. So if we can print something that can caress the body, why not print something that could caress cells? Or take it a step farther and actually even print cells at the same time. That's where we go to bioprinting. So bioprinting is the way that we can do this. The basic idea behind that is we could scan the wound be able to figure out what would be the three-dimensional shape we need to fill, and then come back and fill it with the right cells, the right materials, at the right depth. Literally print a new organ. So th this is an example of a bioprinter uh, in, in my lab, and it really looks a lot like an inkjet printer. It has cartridges, but instead of printing red ink and black ink, it prints cells. It can print the materials that's in here. It can take whatever we imagine in our mind and be able to visualize it. So here's an example of a ear that we were printing. Again, we told the computer how we needed to print it. It began printing the shape out, and eventually we were able to make a piece of bioprinted cartilage that you'd find in your ear. So it's very possible to do this. So we imagine a time where we'll be able to take a, a CT image or an MRI, or maybe even a photograph, be able to convert that into uh, a digitized form that we can uh, then send to our printers and actually print that custom piece of tissue, exactly what we need so we can make the body think it's nothing more than a paper cut. So where do we go from there? Well, we could certainly use it for various features on the face. Uh, no one really wants to have a standard ear or a standard nose, but to be able to actually make something that's custom that's you is possible, or to be able to build those sophisticated organs uh, such as the kidney, that's possible. Really, the, the cliche would be the sky's the limit, but I tell you that the limit is that we can actually meet the demand on that line that we never could see because it's so far up there. It is possible. See, I see a time where the accidents and time and unforeseen occurrences that befell us that we can mend that damage. I see a time where 
the physical damage of acts of evil can be mended. See, I see a time where you'll be going into your doctor's office. The doctor will look and see your organs. Yeah, they're failing. And he looks up at you and he stares you straight in the eye and he says, you know what, your 30 seconds is almost up. Your organ has just gotten printed. Let's go get it in so you can go and enjoy life. That's a future that I see as possible. Yes, the impossible can be possible. Thank you.